Coming up next, is society creating a workforce of snowflakes? And then a law that would make it illegal for employers to contact you after work? And then unbelievable job titles and what they pay and your calls? And it all starts right now. All right, folks, welcome to the Ken Coleman Show. Thrilled to have you with us. We are here to help you win at work and win in life. You can't let a sucky job make your personal life suck. You can't let your, your personal life, which is sucking, make your work life suck. we got to be in focus and on purpose. Is America creating a workforce of snowflakes? Is society at large creating a workforce of snowflakes? Now, I guess I should define what a snowflake is if, if you're not uh, familiar with the... Uh, the way I'm using it. A snowflake is somebody that is wildly sensitive. They are just, they need to be living in a padded room all while wearing a helmet and elbow pads and knee pads. They just, they are so sensitive, looking to be offended around every corner. It's all about them and all about them living as comfortably as possible. This is a snowflake. Did I leave anything out in the control room? Okay. I think that was a pretty thorough definition. We move on. So how about some evidence? All right. Now, this is an article from a real story. This is the New York Post. Uh, published this article of a guy who gets fired in New Zealand, and he brings an emotional support clown to the firing. Yes, this is real. There it is. Now, there's a picture of it. Along with the headline, man being fired brings emotional support clown to the meeting. And there you could see the guy, <laughs> and this is in New Zealand, but th that tells you that this truly is worldwide. There he is with his emotional support clown. Now, how do you say does this come about? I know you people have questions, and I have answers. Uh, the guy's name is Joshua Jack. Auckland, New Zealand is where he was from. And uh, he said he got an email from his employer telling him they needed to have a meeting to discuss his role. It's kind of like, you remember when the girl would say to you, we need to talk? Never in the history of mankind has good happened as a result of that. You know? I mean, I remember, hey, Ken, we need to talk. Oh, gosh, you're bringing up with me. I mean, it's instantly, right? You, you just know what's happening. So this guy got the we need to talk email is how he perceived it. And you listen to this. So he gets the email from his employer. Hey, we need to talk. And then they say, um, you can bring a support person with you. What? You can bring a support person with you? So he already felt like he was going to get fired. And then the email says, not only do we need to have a talk with you this week and talk about your role, you can bring a support person with you. So this is like the girl in high school saying, we need to talk. And uh, if you want to have your mom on the phone while we talk, that'll be okay. It's like, what? How bad is this going to be? <laughs> so this guy said... This is his direct quote. He goes, I thought it was either going to be a promotion or worse, and I thought it was best to bring in a professional, so I paid $200 and hired a clown. Now, on one hand, I like this guy's creativity to bring in a clown. He's clowning the employer, and he should. I think he's essentially going, this is so stupid. I'm going to actually prove it to you. You said in the email I could bring a support person, and I'm going to hire a professional clown. I think he's clowning them. Good on him. Imagine, by the way, those people, right? They're like, okay, yeah, our next, uh, our, we, in 15 minutes, we got Joshua Jack in here. We're going to let him go. And they're all serious, and they're all getting ready with all their freaking leadership speak and crap. And they're all prepared to be serious. Dude rolls in with a clown. <laughs> I, You know what would be great? In my mind, it would be great to have the old school 80s boombox. I'm a child of the 80s. 
Uh, so I got a bunch of millennials and and, and mosaics are going, what's a boombox? Look it up. But I'm picturing this guy walking in, or the clown walking in with one of those giant boom boxes, and it's the it, the circus music. That would be great to me. And the clown juggling, just to really stick it to these idiots. Because these people are idiots. And this is the whole point. You treat people like a snowflake, they're going to act like a snowflake. And this guy, I'm going to give this guy some credit. I don't think he's the snowflake. I don't think for a second that this guy, Joshua Jack actually brought the clown in for support. I totally think he's punking him. And and, and and I think it's good. Good for him. So while the guy... Listen to this. It goes further. Leave that image up on the screen because I want the audience to truly grab this. While the employers were sliding the redundancy paperwork, basically we're letting you go and here's what we got to talk about. Uh, the mime stood up and mimed like he was crying. The clown mimed like he was crying. And then best part, the clown created a unicorn balloon animal and a poodle and handed it to the people. <laughs> that is so great, you morons. And this is what's wrong with leadership. You treat people like kids. Might as well act like a kid. You know what I would have done? I'd have brought in a support miniature pony. Why not? Let's just be ridiculous. Anyway, I need to go forward. So here's what's going on. When companies feel like that they need to email somebody in advance of a bad meeting that you can bring a support person, we have officially lost our minds. And then people will react this way, though. That's what's sad. Most of the world, unfortunately, will act like a sheep when treated like a sheep. You can bring a support person. Oh, should I? Oh, my gosh. I guess it's going to be awful. I need to bring my mom to hold my hand. Here's where this is going. Remote work. Oh, if you scream for remote work, we'll let you do it. We don't want to hurt your feelings. <laughs> you remember the movie Wally, -E, the space robot movie? You remember at the beginning of the movie, put this image up here. This is what this reminds me of. You remember, <laughs> the, 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 see the little fat guy sitting in the chair there? And basically they're showing what they started out like when they all went to space and they did nothing. They sat in their lazy boy all day long and it shows the skeleton there. And then you see the next image. So they're getting a little bit fatter, a little bit softer, and we're losing all shape, all form. And then there's that last image. For our uh, audio-only audience, this is why you need to be checking out YouTube. But anyway, point is, uh, this is what's happening. We are creating a sensitive people. We're, we're creating parameters by which everybody's a freaking snowflake. Don't hurt, hurt my feelings. Don't disrespect me. You, you need to treat me this way, this way, this way. It's like life is a contact sport. And when you try to remove all of the contact, good, bad, indifferent, you create snowflakes. And uh, that's what we've done. All right, so what are the solutions? Really quick, I'm going to hold this over the next segment. You're not going to want to miss those. Number one, how do you not become a snowflake? Listen. Make sure you listen to what people are saying. Two, ask questions to dive in. And then later, reflect on it. Are they right or are they wrong? Coming up next, what do you do if they're wrong? And then how do you move forward and be able to withstand criticism? That's next. You were created to fill a unique role in and through your work. Now, some of you may be going, I have no idea what that is. Some of you may be saying, I know what I want to do, but I don't know how to get there. I felt all of those emotions. I've been where you are, and I can tell you, there's hope. That's why I wrote the book, From Paycheck to Purpose. You can make the income you want and the impact that you desire, and I know that you have what it takes. All right, folks, uh, the public service I'm providing today is to help you avoid becoming a snowflake. I mean, th this is what this is the primary focus of the show, because even if you're a Gen Xer or a boomer, you could become a snowflake at any moment. You really could. 
when you become so focused on yourself and your freaking feelings that you act like a child, you have for the moment transformed into a snowflake. God help you if you begin to live like a snowflake. But all of us have a snowflake in us. Can I just say that? I wanted to be an equal opportunity offender on this issue. We could all get so self-absorbed and so freaking sensitive that we act like a snowflake, which means we have no awareness of the world around us and everything is about us. All right. So how do we receive criticism? Because here's the deal. Snowflakes can't handle criticism. So if you learn how to handle criticism, good, bad, ugly, because there's good criticism, there's bad criticism. And I'm going to break it down. But if you uh, simplify this, if you learn how to handle criticism, you will not become a snowflake. So I, I, I teased it. I kind of ran through it. Let's break it down quickly. And then I got to get to an article in the news in just a matter of minutes. You're not going to believe this. You are not going to believe how snowflakes might be legislated. I'll explain that in a second. But first, number one, I said you got to learn how to listen, not react. Snowflakes hear something that isn't pleasant or pretty or have pretty little music around it, and they go, ah, and they get focused on their feelings. They don't listen to what's actually being said. Listen, have the courage and the maturity to listen. We must listen to the criticism to be able to determine is it constructive or is it destructive? So we got to listen to go, is there something here I can take? Is there something that's on that I was unaware of that, that is a blind spot? But that's why we have to listen. And then we decide, oh, this is constructive or this is destructive. So that leads to the second thing you got to do. After you listen to it, you ask the question, is there any truth in this at all? We start there. Okay, there's some truth to this. How much truth? Why is it true? And we might determine there's no truth in it at all. Although I got to tell you, even the worst, most destructive criticism usually has some little kernel of truth in it. Can I just tell you that? Well, boy, oh boy, does it take maturity to be able to handle that. Third, if you found out that it is largely destructive and it is not true and not healthy, by the way, you're going to have to get other feedback on this, which means you're going to have to toughen up Buttercup and get some other feedback. Because if it's true, guess what's going to happen in the feedback? They're going to verify it and that's going to sting a little bit more. But the positive is, is that when we are confronted and when we receive constructive criticism that we can then use, we can get better. Now, how do we also make sure that even with what I just said, and by the way, I could stop the teaching right there and say, this is enough for you to avoid being a snowflake. However, I'm going to give you one other guarantee. I'm talking lock it up, baby, guarantee. And this is it. After doing those three things, listening, asking the question, is it right, is it wrong, and then making some changes or blocking them out. The fourth piece is to make sure you are in community, in your life with people that are believers and lifters. They believe in you. They'll lift you. Even when you're wrong, even when you've blown it, they're going to go, hey, you learned something. You got this. And see, that keeps you from being a snowflake because you're able to actually receive the criticism, do something with it, or ignore it, and not be walking around like Eeyore. <laughs> you know, woe is me, everybody's mean. And by the way, you know the true snowflake? They actually go from pity party to very quickly being indignant. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, go rewind some of the old school days, the best days of American Idol. I love American Idol, but I don't like new American Idol as much as I like old American Idol. Because Simon flat out dropped the criticism on people. And he was right. And these kids who couldn't handle it, they got their feelings hurt. And then as they walked out of the room, they started freaking out, flipping off the camera, cussing, acting like little tantrums, like just, 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 just embarrassing stuff. And you know what they'd say? Simon Cow, you don't know what you're talking about. I'll prove you wrong. So they become delusional. Emotional to delusional. This is the snowflake problem.
All right, let's go further. Is this really happening, Ken, or are you just cranky today? <laughs> let's dive into it in the news. All right, this is a headline from Forbes magazine, folks. It's not some little cheap rag. Here it is. It's becoming illegal for employers to contact employees after work. What? I can't believe this. Before we get into where this is and how it's happening, a 2021 study reported that nearly half of remote employees were working past midnight during the pandemic lockdown because they said they couldn't get everything done. I asked the hard questions. And it may offend some of you, but put your big boy pants on and your big girl pants on today. I asked the question, if 48% was the number of remote employees reported working past midnight during the pandemic because they said they couldn't get everything done, could they not get everything done because they were at home in their sweatpants watching Netflix and eating Rocky Road ice cream at 2 o'clock in the afternoon? I ask. I wonder. I just wonder. Were they not as effective? I don't know. Generation Z. This is the generation behind the younger generation behind millennials. Um, they were most likely to report working past midnight. 54% of Generation Z work past midnight. Why? I got I got news for you. You know why? Because they've grown up with those freaking screens in their hands. We shoved the cell phone in their hand when they were two to get them to shut up at the at the restaurant. Come on, parents. So they've grown accustomed to staring at screens all hours of the day and certainly at night. I'm not kidding you right now. This is anecdotal. I, yeah, I can't prove it, but I don't have to. You know I'm right. Non-managers, primary reason for working late was they said they weren't able to finish their work during the day. Now, this is interesting. Managers, primary reason for working late was freelancing and working a side job. <laughs> so we got non-managers going, can't get my work done. We got managers who are presumably doling out the work. They're getting side hustles done. Fascinating data. I don't have time to break that one down. Millennials were the most likely to want to continue working at night. Again, millennials, they grew up with screens in their hand. They're in their rooms with the door shut on screens, and they've grown up doing that. So it's no big deal for them. They feel comfortable staring at a screen at night. Uh, so here's the deal. Efforts are afoot to stop companies from violating personal boundaries of employees after hours. That sounds like a snowflake statement. I'm not saying that it's right and healthy for leaders. Leaders, I'll hammer this. I think you all, I'm, I'm very clear on this. Let me, let me make this statement as I go forward. Leader, you are a horrible leader if you are putting pressure on and contacting people consistently after normal work hours. You are a horrible leader. All right, have I made myself clear on that? Okay, good. Uh, in Portugal and France, there's already a law that would put leaders in big trouble if they contact employees after hours, including emails. Now, I, here's I this is I think this is stupid. I think the legislate this kind of stuff is ridiculous because I'm, I'm going to actually empower people in a moment. But let me just say this: if I was going to legislate one thing like this, I would eliminate email forever. By the way, I'd get elected president if I ran on that one issue. I hate email. I think it ought to be removed. It's the biggest bunch of crap and wasted time and inefficient thing that's ever happened. Boy, that fires people up when I drop that bomb. Um, a recent survey of 1,000 employed Americans by Skynova found that 70% uh, of workers reported their employer contacts them outside of normal work hours. So what do you do? If, if you're in favor of this legislation, i got to tell you, you're a snowflake. But I can tell you what to do. So you don't have to put up with this. And I'm going to explain it next. Simple. But I'm going to set you free. This is The Ken Coleman Show. According to Glassdoor, the average job offer attracts over 250 applicants. So if you've made it to the interview, you've already made a great impression. So now is your time to showcase how you are the best choice for this role. That's why we created How to Win the Interview. This free guide will walk you through the five strategies to help you stand out amongst the competition. With just a little intentionality, 
you can prepare yourself to win the interview. To get it, go to kencoleman.com slash interview. All right, folks, welcome back to the Ken Coleman Show, helping you win at work and at home. All right, I'm going to wrap this up. I, I'm keeping this going because I want you to see some data. This idea of, of, of creating laws, New York City is considering it, big surprise, creating laws where it's illegal for companies and supervisors and leaders to uh, contact people after work hours. Now, can I tell you something, folks? I don't think you should be doing it on a, I think emergencies only. Uh, extraordinary circumstances only. I've made my position clear on this. I just don't think it ought to be a law because I think that's impossible to legislate. And then you're going to get your butt fired anyway. You start reporting your... It's stupid. I got one guy in the chat, Capped Picard 81 The boomer energy is strong in the show today. A little shot at me. Hey, let me tell you something, Cap Picard 81 I just told you I'm not in favor of leaders consistently contacting people. But this isn't boomer energy. This is common sense. But this is, he's a snowflake. Because if you get, anybody my age, and I'm middle age, I'm proud of it, 47 years of age, thank you very much. Anybody gets fired up about something, oh, it's boomer energy. By the way, my grandfather used to say, if you throw a rock in a pack of dogs, the one you hit is the one that comes out barking, and that's Cat Picard 81. Might be a snowflake if you're calling what I'm doing today boomer energy. But I digress. Sixty-three percent of employees, listen to this, believe it should be legal for employers to contact them outside of hours. Sixty-three percent said we ought to put a law on this. Nobody's thinking this through. This is awful. This is going to kill corporate culture. But I, I guarantee you, politicians they won't think about that for one second because they're they they have no clue how to lead. Very few politicians have ever led anything effectively. Uh, Sixty-four percent, and here's my takeaway. 64% of workers said they always or usually answered when contacted outside of work hours. Can I share what you need to do? You need to stop answering outside of work hours unless it's about the third or fourth call and the leader's clearly saying this is an emergency. But if it's just an email, you need to have the guts, the intestinal fortitude to not answer it. But if the leader is reaching out to you saying this is an emergency, then we see if this is a pattern. Have some common sense, but also have some guts. Just because they sent an email to you at 7.45 at night doesn't mean you need to reply by 7.50. Stand up to this crap. We, listen, this is a worker's environment right now. You have to be disrespectful. You don't have to be delinquent. But stand up to this kind of crap. The reason that you, the reason that leaders keep doing it is because you keep responding. If it's an emergency, it's an emergency. We all have common sense. Use it. Ah, <sighs> stop replying. They'll stop sending. Just because their life's out of balance doesn't mean yours needs to be. But, 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 Ken, they're my boss. Again, you let them in. You invited them in to your weeknight. Now they think they can hang out. Stop. Stop the insanity. And by the way, one of the great ways to teach leaders how to be better leaders is to put some boundaries up there. And you can do that. You don't have to be disrespectful or a jerk. So, anyway, there's my two cents on that. Moving forward, boomer energy. Oh, Cap Picardi responded, LOL, love it. Okay, good. So, thank you very much for seeing the, the, the error of your chat. Jill joins us in Kansas City. Jill, you're on the Ken Coleman Show. Hi, Ken. Hi, Jill. Uh, first, I want to say thank you for yeah, taking my question and you for bet. everything you guys do. Thank I you. love listening to you guys. You offer a good perspective in a lot of things. Thank you so much. How can I help you today? So um, I'm at a job. I'm a registered nurse. I've been a nurse for 13 years. I have been at my um, current employer for five years. Um, I have been debating for over a year now whether to leave my job to do travel nursing or stay. Okay. Um, my current job has great benefits. Mm -hmm. um, I have great insurance. It's a decent wage. It does, however, um, we have a union, which is good and sometimes not good. Um, but we often get mandated. That's something that we agree to when we hire on. Yep. <clears throat> and it seems like, of course, through COVID, we've been mandated quite often. And 
my schedule puts me in a position where I'm mandated more frequently than others. I've tried to change that. I've been denied that. Um, I've had some other issues. Um, mm-hmm. My father passed away a couple of years ago. I took a couple of weeks off during that time and, you know, was pretty much um, I'm bombarded. I, I felt like I was being kicked while I was down. I had to oh prove that my father actually died. Oh I had to gosh. bring an obituary. Are you actually serious? To, I am serious, unfortunately. Okay, can I, I just interrupt bring, you? Can I interrupt mm-hmm. you? Because I'm on Team Jill. Okay. What are we debating at this point? Well, you know, I love what I do. I yeah. really do. And I, I love, you know, the population of people that I take care of. Yeah. Um, and I do have some good coworkers, you know, people that you would want in the trenches with you. Yeah. I feel bad leaving. If I leave, I feel bad what? leaving them. If you leave in what? The if you leave, that, if you leave, they're stuck with awful leadership. Yes. Is that what you're I, saying? I know. Yes, and one less person to help, you know, carry the load, I guess. Not your problem. But what about the people that I take care of? You know, they've come to know me, I've come to know them. And that's another thing, you know, I... Wait, 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 wait. Somebody else will take that job and take care of those people. Those people are not going to be without care. That is true. I know, I know. And yet, and so you, and by the way, you gave me the option of staying in your current job, which which is sucking your soul out of you. Not the work, but the leadership. Correct. I know. Right. I know. I'm listening. And taking a travel nursing job where you're still a nurse, you're still serving people, caretaking for people, still doing very good work. It's just different environment. And I bet pays a whole lot more as a travel nurse. It does. My biggest concern there too is like insurance because my, like I said, I have really great insurance. You're not going to have insurance Um, as a travel nurse? It's it's not that I won't have it. It may not be as good. Who cares? You're um, making a lot more money. It's true. I know. Um, more money, I'd, better lifestyle. True or false? True. True. More. I mean. Okay. Okay. Hold on. Let me present to you. So instead of me, because I don't feel like I'm convincing you, which is okay. My job is not to convince you. My job is to coach you. Mm -hmm. But let me present to you what I'm hearing and what I think the audience is hearing and watching. Okay, Ken, here's what I got. Need your take. It's Jill from Kansas City, Ken. Real quick. Uh, Ken, debating something, uh, staying in a soulless job uh, where the leadership has literally sucked the life out of me and they treat me like a commodity only. Um, But I really like my coworkers and I feel like if I leave them then they're going to be upset at me because I left them in purgatory. And I don't know if the patients are going to get care. That's one scenario. Or I go take a job as a travel nurse where I have a whole lot more control over my life. It's a better lifestyle, more money, and I'm not working for a leader who's sucking my soul out of my body. And we're having a conversation about this. And you're kind of going, well, yeah, that's what I'm hearing. To me, it's a no-brainer. Mm-hmm. I think you're you got to stop worrying about what everybody's going to say about you. I think that's part of this, and I'm not calling I, you out because I'm upset at you. I'm trying to wake you up to what you've presented to me: better life, better pay, all the things. Versus, well, I don't want to leave my friends behind. These patients aren't going to survive if I leave. That's what I'm hearing you say, even though you're not saying it that way. Do you see what I'm getting at? I see. Yeah, I do. I do. I guess my other concern is because I did start my career later in life. I'm 51. Um, if leaving and not setting, you know, I have a, a pension and retirement where I'm at, you know. Doesn't matter. I I but but you can to investigate you, on how to do that on my own. Yeah, I want outside. you to go talk to one of our smart vester pros. I want you to go to RamseySolutions.com today. Preferably in the next five minutes, find two or three or four smart investor pros in your area, set up meetings with them, interview them, make sure you like them and that they can explain stuff to you understand it and talk about how you're going to roll that stuff over, what you're going to do with that. You'll be making more money. You're going to make more money and you're going to invest more for your retirement. You're not going backwards. Jill, I love you and it's because I love you that I'm going to tell you, stop thinking about this and do it. Nothing to be afraid of. This is The Ken Coleman Show.
Do you know what you were born to do? In order to get hired at a job you love, you need to get clear on your talent, passion, and mission. That's why our team created the Career Clarity Guide. In just a few minutes, this free tool will walk you through a process to discover what you do best, talent, the work you love to do, passion, and the results you want your work to produce. That's mission. Then you're going to feel way more confident throughout the job search process. To get started, go now to kencoleman.com slash clarity. All right, folks, welcome back to the Ken Coleman Show. I'm going to get back to the phones, but I want to uh, I want to tell Army Jen. Army Jen, stay watching live if you can, because uh, in the next segment, I'm going to answer your question. It's a great question in the chat room, but John is ahead of you uh, in Prosperity, South Carolina, on the phones. Let's go to John. John, you're on the Ken Coleman Show. Hey, Ken. Thank you for having me on the show today. You bet. How can I help? So, Ken, I think I've got a good one for you today. Uh-oh. So, I know what my sweet spot is, but uh-huh. my problem is that it is such a small market that people that are already in these roles are all there for the long haul. Like one of those things where someone has to retire to be able to move in. All right. So uh, I appreciate what you're saying, but I don't think that this is limiting as you think it is. But I need to know what it is. What's the job? All right. So my sweet spot is a college head rifle coach for NCAA rifle. So I have all the qualifications. I have a bachelor's in sport management and coaching. I've proven myself as a competitor. You know, wow. I'm a distinguished shooter. I was a college All-American shooter myself, national championship appearance. I'm currently training to try out for Team USA to shoot in the Olympics. So my nice. resume is there. Yeah. Okay. This is great. So I'm right. You are limiting yourself here. Now, now l- let me explain what I mean. Okay. I absolutely understand what you're saying now. When you say it's a very small market, meaning there's only so many uh, head coach or head rifle coach or head shooting coach uh, at colleges. I get that. Very small amount of those jobs. Correct. But where you are limiting yourself is how can you do work you love that involves teaching someone how to shoot or working with guns, instructional in nature, that exist outside of the very small amount of head coaching positions on the college level. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, to kind of branch out, not just limiting myself to college, but kind of branch out to other yes. levels of coaching. Yes, go for the college thing. Go with the gusto because you have nothing to lose. You told me the chances are small. I get that. These people stay in these jobs for 47 years because, <laughs> I mean, it's very small sport. Right. Uh, I've got a good friend who's a Division three golf coach. And he very much wants to be a Division One golf coach, and it's very. There's a lot more golf coaches than there are uh, rifle coaches, but uh, these golf coaches stay in these jobs for a long time. I mean, there's not a lot of turnover. Right. So I understand that. So I've had the same conversation with him. Wait a second, you love golf, you love instructing golf. In high end areas, you can make really good money doing golf lessons. Now you're not going to make great money doing golf lessons in Red Dirt, Idaho. All right, because they don't even have a golf course in Red Dirt, Idaho. Right. But but when we talk about the gun business, I don't think I have to tell you how booming that industry is. Do I? No, so let me me throw another wrench at you real quick, though. Oh, I love wrenches. Okay. So I've got a a college in my state that just had the worst season of their program history, and this has been consistency for the past few seasons. Yeah. Surely the athletic director isn't happy seeing this, so my question, Ken, is, how can I approach this athletic director who isn't even hiring or looking to replace the current coach? Kind of like, how do I make my pitch to open my eyes? Yes, there? Eyes to great to question. I applaud this. This is not a wrench. This is a great question. Here's what you do. You use the proximity okay. principle, and I'm going to give you my book. Do you have the proximity principle in my book? I bet no, you do. No, sir, I don't. Well, today you do. I'm giving it to you. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to read the book. I want you to think about those five people and the five places, the archetypes that I write about in the book. I don't have time to unpack it on the air, but I'm going to give you the right. book. So here's the deal. You treat this like this, this AD, you, you create a little word, a uh, little word story, an image, if you will. Uh, they are like a major investor in your side business. And you find a way to get a meeting with that AD, who I can tell you right now does not give three craps about how good the rifle coach is doing. They just don't. It's not a revenue-generating sport. 
Correct. However, if you get a meeting with this AD and go, look, I, I, I'm coming at you and I'm straight up telling you they had the worst record here. To my knowledge, this is why they had a bad record. Here's what I'm proposing that I would do to turn the program around. And then okay. you, you make your pitch. Why? Because you have nothing to lose. If he laughs you out of the office, fan freaking fantastic. But go for it. You have okay, nothing to lose. Do. I'm going to get an appointment with the AD and we're going to make this happen. Yes, you are. Now, here's what I want you to do. Three-point outline. This is gold. Uh, your conversation with this AD needs to be to the point, telling the problem with the program, the solution to fix it, and the reason why he should give a crap if the record turns around. If you don't do that, you don't have a chance. But if you do that, you got a chance. Hang on the line. We're going to get you a copy of my book, The Proximity Principle. Coming up next, I'm going to answer a chat question. Back to the phones and, uh, oh, no, fun job title, crazy job titles and what they pay. That's next. Are you wondering if you should leave your current job or stay put? Well, you're not alone. That's why we created the Should I Quit My Job quiz. In just five minutes or less, this quiz will help you determine if you're at the right company and if you're in the right role. And if you need to make a move, you'll get practical steps to keep you moving forward. Folks, it's time to get unstuck. Life is too short not to do what you were created to do. Go take the quiz right now at kencoleman.com slash quiz. All right, folks, welcome back to the Ken Coleman Show. Thrilled to have you with us. 844-747-2577. There's been a lot of buzz lately all over the Internet about Phil from ZipRecruiter. Everybody's saying a form of thank you, Phil. Thank you, Phil. Phil, you rock. Phil, you're the man. All this kind of stuff. Why? Because Phil and ZipRecruiter are helping people get great gigs. Elisa M. said, Phil, you're amazing. You gave me the confidence I needed to land an awesome job. Thank you, Phil. Uh, you need Phil and ZipRecruiter in your corner. How do you do that? It's a free service, by the way, to you. Companies pay ZipRecruiter for the talent. That's you. Hottest job market in history. You better. If you want to move, now's the time. Go to ZipRecruiter.com. ZipRecruiter.com. All right, quick question in the chat room. And then, oh, folks, it's my favorite segment of the show. It's quickly becoming my personal favorite. Unbelievable job titles and what they pay. These are real jobs. It's unbelievable. Uh, there was a question in here from Army Jen. Uh, she said, Ken, I have a second interview with a company on Monday. They're paying $5,000 less per year than my present job. How do I ask for the amount I need appropriately? I got to get out of my job. It's toxic. And then I told her to hang on, and she goes, oh, here's some more info. <laughs> I'm almost certain my current employer will counter when I give my notice. This is not my spot. The new job is clearly where I'm to be. Okay. I like what you did there, Army Jen. Army Jen, listen to me. I don't care if your current employer counters. It's toxic. You already said it's toxic. I don't care. You're not supposed to be there. Now, the first part of your question, how do you, they've offered you a job that's 5,000 less than your current job. And you go, how do I counter essentially or ask for what I need appropriately? Well, first of all, you are a very pleasant person and a polite person just by nature of the question. Don't worry about that. Here's what you do. You go, listen, hey, thank you so much for the offer. I got to tell you, I'm excited because I think it's where I'm supposed to be. Here's the problem. It's, it's less than I'm making where I am currently, and I can't go backwards financially right now. If, if the offer is this and give them the number, which is either 5,000 higher or 7,000 higher or 8,000 higher, and you stand your ground. You don't have to be a jerk about it. Just go, oh my gosh, I'm so excited. I think this is a great culture and tell them all these good things like compliment and go, but here's the problem. I, I can't, I can't take a $5,000 pay cut or six, you know, what you, whatever you want to say there, fill in the blank. All right. And then, so just push the, push the offer right back across the table. Chances are they're going to pay you. So there you go. All right. Why do we do this fun little segment? That's as, as real as it can be. Unbelievable job titles, what they pay. Because I'm trying to encourage those of you out there who are so freaking scared to pivot and to change. And this is, it's an entertaining segment, but it's also aimed at jostling some of you and pushing you out of the nest. Because you go, I, I, I. and it's just proving the point that 
there's a job for anybody. Here we go. First title, a train pusher. <laughs> By the way, every week when you we do, <laughs> is that a real picture of a train pusher? Okay, so if you're watching this, you got a guy. Yeah, we got a guy on the screen here who is uh, bear hugging what looks to be like two or three different adults. And he is pushing them onto a overly crowded train. This is a train pusher. Now, when I saw this, I thought, is this somebody who like pushes the train in the train yard when it's been disconnected? No. A pusher is a worker who physically pushes people onto a mass transportation vehicle at a crowded stop. Most commonly used in Japan and China. Are you kidding me? You know who's perfect for this? The person who was a little bit of a control freak, maybe in high school and college, and you never got to act out on it. I used to live in Japan, and I saw this all the time on the trains. Is this right, Amanda? Yeah, absolutely, 100%. Are people aware that that's what's happening, or is it always like, hey, hey, what are you doing? Do I know you? Is it one of those deals? No, no, because they see it as like we're trying to be proficient and get everyone on the train. How do they, boy, I got to feel like there's so much potential um, uh, insurance risk on this. If the train pusher pushes grandma down below Bubba and Bubba steps on her, I, I don't, I, this is very interesting to me. But I got to tell you, I love the concept. What are your um, certifications and education requirements? Um, customer service skills, really? What, where does customer service, this is real. They want you to have customer service skills. To push somebody in a train? I would change that to, if you are a bit of a jerk and cranky, we'd love to have you. Uh, listening skills? What, what What's the listening skill for? Hey, stop, you're crushing me. Is that, uh, it must be what that deal is. And then physical strength. This is the one I agree with. So what's the pay? $46,000 a year, according to ZipRecruiter. $46,000 a year to push people in a train. Hey, this is a great starting job for a lot of punks coming out of college. Next. You got to be kidding me. Netflix viewer or tagger? This is a person responsible for watching movies and shows that uh, will be available to stream in the future, analyzing them and describing them using tags. The Netflix algorithm then uses these tags to give recommendations for viewers. Perks include flexible hours, you think? The ability to work from home, you think? Never, ever, ever take a shower or brush your teeth. Uh, that's not in there, folks. I added that. Sorry. And watching hours and hours of movies and TV shows. Boy, I got to go home and tell my 16-year-old this is a job. He's going to be thrilled. Do they offer this to 16-year-olds for summer work so he could pay for his car? I need to know more. This is according to... Um, Oh, thank you. TheMuse.com. You ready for this? You can make up to $100,000 a year. The certifications in education, a degree in film or film history, or experience directing, screenwriting, or filmmaking. Can I just tell you that's exactly horse crap? Why would you need a degree or experience in any of those things to watch something and give a real viewer's opinion? So this is where this gets weird. You got to have a film degree for this? Come on. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to break that down. And last, oh, this is very nice. This is very warming here. The job title is Santa. Obviously, we know what we're talking about here. This is the professional Santa Claus who plays Santa Claus at the mall or Christmas events, interacting with children and adults and yada, yada, yada. Certifications, education, none. Necessary skills. Professional Santas require a real beard. A quality Santa suit and the ability to make every experience unique and personal. The pay, now this is unbelievable, but not unbelievable in the world we live in now since Christmas starts right after Halloween. You ever you notice in that now? I saw Christmas decorations prior to Halloween this year. It really put me in a bad attitude about the best time of the year. It's too soon. Pay ten thousand to sixty thousand dollars over a six week season. Sixty grand. For being fat and having a white beard and a good suit and a nice laugh. That's a pretty good deal over six weeks. And you prepare for that all week, all year long by eating cookies and milk, drinking milk. Fantastic. I love it.
$10,000 to $60,000 over a six-week season. Businessinsider.com, the source for that. So why do we share that with you? Because there is work for everybody. Keep in mind, we've had armpit sniffer, snake milker, uh, water slide tester. I mean, look, if you want to get paid to be a kid, paid to do something fun, why don't you at least look around? The point in, in us sharing these kind of jobs are for you to realize that doing work that you are good at and that you enjoy, that uh, creates results. That you, listen, it's different for everybody. And there's a lot of jobs out there. You're not, you need to be looking. You might be surprised at what you could do. Because here's the deal. If you are in a gig where you feel stuck in an environment where you don't feel there's any growth, you're in a toxic environment or you're bored, these are three big reasons why people just are like, oh, I don't want to go in on Monday and I can't wait till Friday. You don't have to accept that is the point that we are making. My goodness. You know what I think would be a fun show is to get some college kid that is like over leveraged with student loan debt and they have no idea what they want to do with their life and have them do all of these jobs for a two year period or three year period. And they put all the money has to go to paying off their loan, but they just try stuff like this and just document. It'd be fantastic. All right. For my listening audience, I am almost done. Thank you for joining us for our viewing audience. Hang out. We got another bonus segment coming your way. This is the Ken Coleman show. Press on. Thanks for listening to The Ken Coleman Show. For more, you can find the show on demand wherever you listen to podcasts and watch the show on YouTube. You can also find Ken across all social media by following at Ken Coleman. Welcome back to the Ken Coleman Show, helping you win at work and in life. 844-747-2577 is the phone number if you want to jump in. Great group today in the uh, in the chat room of YouTube. You all are uh, uh, a little spicy today, and I like it. But let's get back to the phones. Amy joins us in Phoenix, Arizona. Amy, you're on the Ken Coleman Show. Hi, Ken. Thanks. You bet. I want to hear your thoughts. Um, I'm in one of those jobs where uh, I'm not stimulated, bored, no no room for growth. I don't hate going to, to work. Uh, what I did, though, was I took advantage of an opportunity. They were paying for some school, grad work, um, mm-hmm. business administration. I went ahead and took advantage of that because it, it, I thought it would help me with my brain stimulation. Side note, I already have a, a master's degree. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> long story short, um, you know, I just, every day is different for me. Some days I'm just compelled to keep looking for a different job and to exit out of so it. So why but, aren't you? Well, because I got to give them a year afterwards. How much do you have left uh, in the year uh, of penance? Eight, eight months. Okay. Eight months. Okay, great. You know what? Eight months goes by like that. And, and I got to tell you, not only does it go quickly, it's also a nice buffer for you to begin looking today. And you need to be lining something up so that the second the eight months is done, you're submitting your resignation. Even though I have to still give them a year technically or I'll have to pay it back. Oh, I thought we were on the same page. I thought the year is going to be up in eight months. No, sorry. I mean, the graduate, the graduation will be eight months and then the year will commence. Okay. I misunderstood. So we have eight months. So we've got, uh, uh, 12 and eight, 20 months, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, you're stuck. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what else to tell you. You, you, you. This is the deal. You signed up for it. You said, uh, I'll do this education if you pay for it, but I got to give you a year's service. It's like being an indentured servant from the old days. You got to do it. So you got 20 months to A, figure out what you want to do. I'll help you with that. B, we go looking for it. We line it up. But I, my advice is still the same. When the, tw- when, the, when the year is up, 20 months from now, you're out of there. Hit the eject button. You don't owe them one second more than the year. Am I right? Correct. All right, then. Do you feel bad about that? I feel like you feel bad about that. 
No, you know, I think, uh, like I said, some days are better than others. And sometimes my thought process is, okay, I'll find a job where the salary kind of takes care of that. <laughs> of course you do. You know why? Because you have already figured out there is not a position in that company that allows you to be on purpose, true or false. That's true. All right, then. What do you want your life to look like five years from now, 10 years from now? Does it include this place? No. Of course not. Nah. Amy, I think you called me for permission, and I tried to grant you permission a couple minutes ago. I can't be any more clear on saying, yes, you should be looking, and yes, you should be leaving. Period. Got it? Yeah. You you excited? No, I am. I just, I needed to hear an outside opinion. Yeah, you're not a bad person. I, I, I You're not a bad person for going, you know what, I did my time. Amy, let me remind you of something because you're so worried about being a bad person because you're actually a great person. But let me remind you something. This is going to step on your toes a smidge. The only reason you owe them a year is because you took their money to get an education because you were (laughs) bored. (laughs) Am I right? That's a fact, yeah. So what do we feel about... You should feel bad about taking their money for the education because you were bored. I'm kidding. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't feel bad at all. Do what is required of you. Move on. Head high. I appreciate the call, Amy. Hey, folks, let me tell you something. Here's the final thought for today because we get a lot of calls like this from the Amy's of the world. You don't owe your employer a life of average... You don't owe your employer a life of frustration. You do not owe your employer a life of misery. Period. There's nothing else in the sentence. Stop feeling guilty for being who you're supposed to be and living the life you want to live. That's it. I got to get out of here. Before I do remember this, you matter and you do have what it takes. This is the Ken Coleman Show. Press on.